you know, while you're working as a postdoc or as, you know, studying for your PhD, that's a great opportunity to obviously do your research, but also develop your network and create relationships and have, you know, sort of that like human safety net um, for when you need to make a change. Yeah, it's uh, as you, you're absolutely right. It's the connections that you form. This is actually one of my uh, biggest recommendations for people is that. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Quantopian Show. Uh, this week's conversation is with Yuri Malitsky. Yuri started his career uh, with a PhD in computer science and his PhD and postdoc work focused on algorithm configuration and selection techniques. We'll talk to him today about his move from academia to industry, first at IBM Watson and then at JP Morgan. Yuri's done high-level computer science research, original machine learning work, and most recently has been studying product analytics at a major financial data provider. All along the way, he's kept his academic connections, uh, lately by lecturing at the University of Virginia's data science program. Yuri, welcome to the uh, welcome to the Quantopian Show. Boss, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I wanted to start with kind of a big question. I feel like uh, you're in a unique position to comment on the rapid evolution of LLM and other generative techniques. Uh, this really, you know, very recent release this week of GPT-4 Turbo with its really large context window just feels like a major event. Um, you know, I think so much of the work, including my own dabbling, mm-hmm. was just dealing with constraints uh, for GPT. So I'm really curious, like, what you make of it? Is it a big deal? What do you think it means for, for this part of the industry? I mean, the technology, this is a big question. The technology has been uh, going through leaps and bounds uh, of uh, just at such a rapid, cl- uh, rapid clip because uh, j- before, yes, the context window was uh, limited, but then uh, people started figuring out, well, we can actually compress the um, uh, these context windows. We can do things like, uh, what is it, sparse priming representations where they figured out exactly which portions of the LLM do they need to prime with significantly less text just to get the same results. We saw another group that was um, advertising 1 million token size uh, context windows, uh, which uh, was also uh, mind blowing. And now uh, with OpenAI releasing their new tools that they dropped the price, making it a a lot more affordable. They've created uh, the assistance, which I'm dying to play uh, around with. Yeah, Um, that looks so cool. Oh, it's absolutely. What I really want to, uh, do first of all, it allows you to have all of these new tools at your fingertips that you only dreamed of before. The fact that it's just statistically predicting the next word is still mind-boggling to me. But what I'm really interested in the assistance is um, trying to get some of my old Kobo bases into them, so that because you know, especially for your old projects, you've worked on them years ago, you don't quite remember how everything fits together, but all of the code is there. Yeah. So now you have uh, both your rag system, you have your assistant, you provide the code, and now you can uh, identify, okay, what are the relationships? Where uh, is there anything that I can do to the architecture of my code in order to improve it, to streamline it? Um, and that sounds like so exciting. Sorry. Can you linger on that point about the architecture? Actually, maybe uh, just go back a few steps and explain sure. what AI assistant uh, or the, the API assistant is. Um, so kind of with the AI, yeah. so I, I will confess here, I haven't yet uh, played around with it. So from my understanding, uh, what they have done is uh, they've created um, the interfaces to allow for a simplified way of creating a RAG system uh, just built in, facilitating um, the uh, utilization of it. So this is uh, where you can specify for your bot what it is, here is your context, here are the documents that are specific to me, that are of interest to me, uh, that you should be referencing when I'm asking questions of you. And then you can have this assistant uh, create, uh, creating and answering que- uh, your questions, uh, helping you out with uh, certain tasks where it's already been primed with the information that you needed. So they're lowering the barrier to, in- uh, to entry. Uh, so that's my current interpretation of what they have done. But again, uh, I need to play around with this stuff just comes out way too fast. 
Yeah. Yeah. What do you actually, what do you think's behind that? Do you think this is like uh, the beginning of an arms race? Is it because they feel like they need to get ahead of Anthropic? Like what do, what do you think's driving this incredible recent I, race? I don't think it's an arms race. I think it's, um, I mean, partially maybe, but it's just, it's all of a sudden you've had um, very little pro uh, prog uh, progress for years. And now we have opened up a new tool that we don't know the limits of it. So everything you do is, is uh, potentially impactful. It changes it. And it's such a radical um, change in the way that we think and that the way that we develop that that's what's uh, really behind it. Uh, it's people don't know where the limits are and the uh, barrier to entry is so low that anybody can try it. Uh, and uh, because the OpenAI team had made it publicly available, anybody can try it. So it's now just a matter of imagination of where exactly is the limit. Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're still, we're still seeking, limit seeking. Exactly. Uh, one of the things you just mentioned, I think is really worth lingering on, which is just how easy it is to make applications with AI. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering like, what do you what do you think that holds for the future? You know, if it's so easy to create, like the it, it's weird because the applications that you can make are very sophisticated, um, and yet they're easier to make. It's a very like kind of unnerving experience to create something um, with with uh, Gen AI where you're asking it to program because uh, it's almost it's just like too easy to to produce yeah. things. Well, the thing is, is that it is easy. But in terms of just uh, replacing software engineers in the near term, I don't think we're there yet because I, I've had a number of uh, non-coding friends that um, were all of a sudden able to program. They're able to spin up a website. They're able to spin up certain applications. The problems uh, occur when things go wrong, right? First, so first of all, you can spin it up. But if anything goes wrong, you have no idea how to debug it, uh, where and how things work. This is one of the things that I keep telling my students. The reason why I'm uh, enforcing that there is no chat GPT on the exams or anything like that is that it's for your own good. You need to understand the tools in order to then be able to understand when the model is hallucinating, when it's making the mistakes and why those mistakes occur. Once you know, then you can just uh, start using and then you can start automating uh, whatever it is that you need. The other problem um, with uh, coding right now is that it is phenomenally good for things that it has seen a thousand times, right? Uh, in terms of creating a website, there are thousands of examples online of how to do that. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, spinning up some TCP connections, um, thousands of examples, they can do that. If you are trying to create something that's new, that is very bespoke and very uh, um, particular to the problem that you're solving, it can't do that. It, it struggles, it gives you, uh, it falls back on things that it knows and uh, it gets stuck in loops. So um, there, there's still going to be a lot of opportunity for, uh, well, quite frankly, the fun stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there, is there a, like a example of that failure mode that you're, you're talking about that you've run into recently or that you've heard from others where like- uh, A friend of mine, uh, so uh, uh, that, that is uh, doing the video game uh, that uh, we discussed uh, a little bit before, um, what he is uh, trying to do is to create the orbital dynamics uh, be, uh, be, between uh, different planets and uh, making sure that um, you know, uh, creating a grid-like uh, system for the game uh, and making sure that everything moves according to our bespoke um, uh, physics for the game. Because it's bespoke, because nobody has done it before, yeah. um, it doesn't know, it, it didn't know how to build those mathematical uh, formulations. So they had uh, all of the logic, all of the um, objects uh, needed to be built from scratch. Um, and it was completely helpless there. But for things like, hey, I need to do a lecture series on the introduction to machine learning, 
right. give me a couple of examples to sh showcase this example. Easy. It simplifies life so much. Yeah, it is incredible. What do you what do you think will happen with that um, that type of problem, like the you know sort of like first time something's being coded? Is that is that uh, going to be reached by these techniques, or do you think it's it's something that will always require the human touch? I mean, uh, I, I have now become uh, skeptical uh, of saying that it will always require the human touch. Uh, the field is just uh, changing way too rapidly. Um, the, uh, there are some exciting things that um, I, I, I'm seeing people are, uh, are doing. Uh, one of them, because uh, we now have these assistants, right? There is a group out there that decided, well, what if we created assistants that are able to create their own assistants once uh, they come up with a particular challenge that they need to do? So it's uh, essentially figuring out how do you create a swarm of uh, tools that have very specific uh, jobs uh, to target? Now, they are not yet successful, but this is what they're trying to create. And with that, you can see that um, you might stumble upon something new, test it, verify it, and then uh, develop it. Um, how successful it is, I don't know, but it might actually lead to a breakthrough. Most of the coding that I've done has been um, you know, like small projects. Uh, the, the really big benefit that I've gotten is if I need to interact with with an API, especially like sort of a big API uh, that I haven't used before, um, you know, for prototyping and stuff like that. I I don't know. I I'm sort of a lazy doc reader. I like to like just in time read documentation as opposed to uh, sort of learning a whole system and then using it. And um, with, with ChatGPT, I've been wondering like, will I ever read documentation again? Because uh, you know, GPT's read all the documentation. I can prompt it. No. Um, but what I what I sort of learned from interacting with it uh, to generate code is um, you really have to think carefully about sort of the right intermediate step that you want, and and you have to prompt it to like the right unit of work. Yeah. And um, for Python coding, I've found it's it's basically a function. Like you can describe a function to it, you can ask it to use an API in that function, you know, and mm -hmm. and kind of, you can kind of talk to it. Like you would to a programmer, uh, you know, yeah. to a colleague about um, coding something like that. And what I've been wondering about is uh, for a more like complex system, like a system as opposed to a tiny unit, um, you know, it, 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 when I've tried to prompt it to do things that are like, you know, mildly ambitious, it usually just comes back with like instructions for me, like here are the steps that you have to go through. And so yeah. I think like a really interesting area though is thinking about like what are what are those like intermediaries and uh, is there like a you know like another language you might use uh, like a DSL for describing the structure of a software system and then having it implement pieces of it. Um, I'm also curious about like maintenance. You know, there's so much labor required to maintain software. Yeah. And, but it's very similar. Like a lot of maintenance is not just bug finding, but like refactoring or, you know, um, just updating it with the latest technology, yeah. the latest technology. Exactly. Like a lot of method signature changes, or, you know, if you have like a data model change that changes cardinality between elements, sometimes that'll like, just like cut through your whole code base. And, um, you know, it'd be so cool to be able to offload that. Uh, to an agent, but it's just that I, I I don't know if I'm not approaching it in the right way, but it seems like very difficult. Like I haven't yeah. really started at all in terms of having it, uh, you know, do that kind of maintenance work. I mean, it's the main uh, creating uh, something new is a lot easier than maintaining it, yeah. right? Uh, because um, even uh, if we define the architecture, okay, we know what are the cases that we want to capture. We uh, can generally sketch out. Um, um, what the um, structure should be in, uh, in terms of the connections and the functionality. And we can probably start defining that these are the functions that we need to uh, develop, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned before that, okay, when something breaks, if you do it completely automatically, you don't know what exactly bro broke and why. 
and um, it require uh, it requires I think a level of understanding of the program that um, you don't yet have as a machine, right? Because yeah. it must uh, it it needs to understand causality at that point in terms of this uh, function is causing this thing to misbehave right. in this particular corner case, um, which is the other reason why I think that um, there's a whole lot of uh, views that these um, uh, LLMs are going to replace the jobs of software engineers in, the, in a year or two years, et cetera. Um, I think uh, one of the things that people don't realize is just the amount of technical debt that companies have. Uh, the complexity of all of the uh, tools and integrations that have to work and can have to continue to work uh, as you fix them. Um, well, so I have a question about that. Uh, yeah. I've been thinking about a lot. And it, that, if you make the leap to, um, you can you can use Gen AI to generate like a whole software system or even even like a complete library, let's say, yeah. um, before you get into like deployment and all that stuff, just, just a library. What I was thinking is, um, so I was using I was using uh, ChatGPT to write uh, newsletters. I was experimenting mm -hmm. with that, right? And what I found is it's sort of like a compile step, is the way it feels like, where you have you have code like a like I have like Python with Langchain, and I'm prompting to get what I want, and I just like throw these newsletters away. Like I produce a newsletter, it's not quite what I want, so I chuck it and I get another iteration. Yeah. You know, work on the prompt. And um, what is kind of strange about that is like if I wrote a newsletter, I mean, I have definitely thrown away entire newsletters before that I've written myself, yeah. but um, not not like with the speed and frequency that I was in this mode. And it's because it costs me nothing, right? It's like very little time to generate. Yeah. So if you can generate an entire code library, what I was thinking is like, would you debug it? Would you maintain it? Or would you just chuck it and regenerate it? You know, if you're able to regenerate the whole thing in a few minutes. That's, uh, it's interesting. The, the thing is though, it, um, it needs to act in a environment, right? Which means that uh, you might throw away one package, but then you have other things that are still dependent on it. So whatever you create that's new, Either you create the entire thing from scratch, which uh, let's face it, it is a lot of res computational resources that yeah. we are burning through. Um, yeah. So um, there, uh, there's going to be that. Um, I just feel like I, we're heading I, toward I, this world where a lot of creative work is like disposable. Yeah, you know, um, because I've definitely seen that. If I'm uh, writing. Um, uh, let, let's say a, a summary or, or of something and I don't like the first uh, pair, uh, couple of lines, I don't bother reading the rest and just say, just redo it, uh, mm -hmm. with, yeah. change the tone. Um, and yeah. it's, yeah, it's so much w uh, wasted material. Um, and it, and it, then it doesn't uh, get you quite uh, where you want it. So you uh, go a completely different route. Uh, uh, so and you're not and you're not even really training the model at that point, right? Because you're not explaining it to it what uh, it should be doing uh, better and what you're liking or not liking. So it will be an interesting problem to have a more interactive uh, session uh, with the model so that uh, you can actually explain and work so that the next time that you're dealing with uh, writing the newsletter, it's not the yeah. just in the prompt, but it knows who you are. But now you were dealing right. with assistance right. uh, with memory. Yeah, actually, yeah. that's a really good point. Um, I've been uh, so tomorrow is my big day to play around with this. I can't wait. But yeah, the uh, basically limitless context is so interesting because you're right. It's like a relationship at that point. They're gonna, you know, yeah. um, it, it'll accumulate um, from the conversation from from the person the person that they're uh, connecting with. Um, so I think uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about is, uh, is there, you know, there's so much hype around uh, Gen AI. Are there other techniques that you think are underrated that um, hold a lot of prom promise? Like, is there anything that's that's like on the, on the horizon that you're excited about that, you know, we'll be maybe talking about uh, with the same 
enthusiasm in uh, on, over 18 months? It's hard to imagine. But. It, it, it's hard to imagine. Um, the thing is, is that, um, and I've ri uh, written a little bit of, uh, about this, is that um, even with the hype of all of these LLMs, the standard techniques are uh, really shouldn't be forgotten or discarded because at the end of the day, LLMs are text generators, right? They're predicting what the next word should be. There, uh, there are some interesting articles written where they're saying that um, there is some proof that they are beginning to abstract and actually understand how to do certain uh, additions or uh, computations. Mm -hmm. But would I trust it to do any sort of trading on my end? Uh, absolutely not. Right. So, okay. it, so you still need all of the tools that will make the predictions, that will uh, do the analytics, that do uh, do the calculations, um, and then um, work, um, and and then come back, combine back with the LLM to just give the result. Um, uh, I don't honestly. I don't see anything else that is uh, quite as exciting as the stuff with LLMs because uh, they are so incredibly pervasive uh, into uh, into our work with robotics, into our uh, work with uh, text to speech. There was one um, un um, university that uh, I, I was helping a group uh, work on, um, basically creating a negotiation uh, training app. Right, uh, where like a would, training app for humans to use for humans, to... yeah. So you would uh, you would go into a, a VR environment. You would talk to uh, a particular agent uh, and uh, negotiate, uh, do uh, specific negotiation steps uh, in order to bring down the price of a contract. Right, uh, training session. First of all, the amount of code for the LLM was quite uh, quite small, but now we are uh, doing. Uh, uh, you know, image processing, text processing, uh, voice to speech, uh, te uh, text, uh, voice to text, um, and all of those technologies which are building on top of each other in order to build a more interactive uh, experience. Um, with uh, OpenAI, uh, they've just release, uh, released uh, Whisper, which is their uh, text to speech. Yeah. Um, and within a couple of days, there are people that are creating automated um, commentary uh, bots. So they basically take a video, break it down into 15 second chunks, and then they have uh, in, uh, in real time, a machine that is uh, analyzing what is going on in the image, generating the text and commenting on it. So they were doing it for uh, League of Legends, uh, I think it's a League of Legends, uh, uh, a game where okay, it's like this knight is going into the middle uh, round. It's uh, this is going like, to be a, a ex play by yeah. play for for League of Legends. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a play by play for League of Legends, uh, and it has personality, which which is insane. Um, so, I I think what the what makes LLMs exciting is not so much that hey, it's just Gen AI it's created a system in which you have um, multiple um, uh, uh, systems now talking to each other, right? You, uh, if you, uh, there was another uh, project that uh, applied the LLM to vision and had the robot interact with objects. And uh, you, uh, you can ask it, okay, pick up the, uh, the extinct animal. And it, uh, based on what it's seeing in the image, it knows that, okay, this is the dinosaur and therefore it's picking it up and moving it, right? Um, Boston Dynamics have put uh, the LLM into spot their robotic dog so that oh, it can really? now, rather than uh, reading out all of the uh, numbers that it's collected in its um, evaluation of, let's say, a, 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 a plant, uh, you can now talk to it. It's like, were there any anomalies that you have seen in this plant? Uh, uh, and it can talk back to you. So you don't need that computer yeah. interface. Yeah, yeah. that's but, interesting. So this like glue layer is, it's really about connecting it to people, it sounds like, right? Yeah. It's, it's like a new HCI. Because it's a way of connecting a human speech into code, right? Uh, into a machine understandable uh, framework. Uh, and that's, I think, something that we uh, we haven't had before. 
uh, which is what makes it uh, uh, the most exciting thing on the platform. And look, even if uh, like uh, with AI back in the 50s that we're going to face another AI winter, right? It, um, and we're not going to get the uh, the artificial general intelligence or the uh, other big breakthroughs. Um, the amount of stuff that the current systems can do, right? Yeah. Um, once they are integrated, um, it's already a lot. It's a di it's a dynamic shift, um, and it will have a huge effect because we're seeing uh, entire industries uh, being essentially erased and automated overnight. Uh, the graphics and uh, text writing is the most notable, but. I mean, now that we have the text to speech, uh, you have uh, cold calls that can be automated. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that, that that's another interesting uh, one. Is just the like it, it's taking these activities that were human scale. I mean, you had to like get people and train. Like, if you think of like running an inside sales group, right? You have to get people. You have to train them on your product. You train them on the technology to make the calls. They have to, you know, then execute them one by one. Uh, they, you can't change that system very quickly. Um, and now all of a sudden it's got a software tempo where you could like on the same day, right. You could do a thousand calls in the first hour in parallel. And then, you know, taking a yeah. uh, tweet, you can AB, you can AB test the calls live throughout the day. I mean, it's, it's really, really pretty amazing to think about how fast things like that will get optimized. The other thing to consider though, it, we, we and I, I think more people need to pay attention to this, is that we are talking about all of the good things that um, this technology is providing. Yeah. Um, before, um, I was comfortable with the fact that it's like, okay, I have a uh, Gmail, I have uh, uh, emails, and I'm comfortable that, okay, even though Google owns them all, right, they would, uh, nobody is going to read them. Nobody, uh, they might get some personality questions. They might do some advertisements. Yeah. Yeah. But now anybody that hacks that system, um, it, it's no longer a question of are you important enough to bother um, mining all of that information because it was before expensive. Yeah. Now I can build an entire profile of you because I know every single email right. that you have written. Um, it's the it's the death of obscurity. None of yes. us none of us are obscure anymore. Exactly uh, because. Now we have these tools that can mine through all of this information, and that's a little bit concerning. I'm not, I, I'm not going to be one of those uh, doomsayers, uh, but it's something to really consider about what does that actually mean when everything you do, all of your operations, everything that you've written um, uh, can be mined. And, yeah. yeah, It's very exciting. Like, I think it's two sides to the same coin that you're saying, because on the one hand, how exciting is that for yourself? Like to, to live with perfect recall, right? You'll be able to like pull up any, like there's uh, an app called Rewind that uh, will literally just monitor everything that you're doing on your uh, machine, you know, uh, yeah. in Excel, and then you can you can chat with it and remember everything you've ever done. So that that sounds just amazing to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Like what a, what a jump in productivity. Uh, and immortality potentially because that model will live forever <laughs> right <laughs> that's interesting um i never considered that it would become like uh, a model of me it's more but i guess i guess it could i guess you could look at it that way yeah um but that, yeah but then the other side of it is uh like everyone has this power now and anything that's captured as data can be indexed in this way yeah um, because it, it it's the where everything can be way more targeted, right? Uh, in, in terms of just advertisements, right? Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, that, that that's going down the doom and gloom. Uh, which yeah. There there are many scenarios in which the, uh, this can go uh, wrong, but uh, it's still not really a reason to uh, stop the development of it because the technology is there um, and the capacity of it to do good is uh, so overwhelming that right. um, it should be developed. I wonder also if there's potential for it to protect us from some of these things. You know, if you think about like social media, uh, you know, there are certain there are certain systems that are like really difficult to 
um, completely trust markets and capitalism to drive, right? So like a lot has been said about social media and, and the fact that it's like an attention, um, you know, capture economy and therefore it leads to really, you know, obscenely optimized mm -hmm. uh, algorithms to hold your attention and, yep. you know, probably not good for you, probably really not good for you if you're a teenager. Um, and uh, I was actually just listening to a great podcast um, that was about uh, uh, ultra processed foods. And it's, it's quite similar, actually, just like an optimization process where the reward for the, the economic reward for the company is just basically consumption. Like the more consumption, the better. Yeah. Or a single person consumes, the faster they consume, the better. And it's not, it's not that um, these companies set out to do this, but they're operating in an incentive structure that kind of like leads, you know, leads them to that optimization problem. Yeah. Um, with, with social media, I was thinking, you know, the same kind of power where it can index everything and you can, you can tell it what you want, you know, it, it creates a lot of agency. And so I, I think I, I know there are tons of startups right now trying to apply this, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if the startups will win or if it's more of like a business, uh, change for the incumbents, but it just seems so exciting to me to be able to have some agency over what's coming to your feed. Yeah. Uh, you know, like imagine if you could say something simple like, hey, I want you to cheer me up today. Right. Yeah. Or um, you know, today I feel like I, you know, want to just uh be learning something about, you know, world events or you know, I don't understand what's happening in the Middle East. I want to read about that. I want it to be, you know, as objective as possible. Or, you know, um, I just want to have some fun, like show me, show me some fun stuff. I have like an hour that I can, I can spend doing this. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting to think of having, um, much more agency because, because of this, uh, technology. I don't know. Do you think that's yeah. too optimistic? I, I like the idea. Um, I, I am a little bit pessimistic on the business side of it, um, to make it true. Because for everything um, that you're saying, I'm uh, uh, count, uh, imagining all, all of the other ways where it's just um, um, being even more directed. Plus, it requires um, your direct agency uh, to specify that this yeah. is what you want, right? Yeah. And uh, it's pushing it. Now, you can have a benevolent uh, robotic overlord that says, okay, uh, in order to create an optimal uh, human species, we actually need to give them a variety of information. And uh, this is the best way of uh, creating the, uh, what is it, your world beliefs. But now we're getting into a, a, a much more dystopian yeah. view. At that point, at that point, you're like, please treat us like pets. Trees, please treat us yes. like pets. We're not cattle, we're pets. Exactly. Let's talk about the um, um, uh, optimistically, right? Um, these LLMs have made um, data available because before there were research articles that were uh, written. Yeah. Now you can ask it to say, okay, explain this to me in an understandable way. Yeah. So now you can actually start learning the material. You, uh, you're able to dig it into, you can ask it as many questions as you would like. Uh, in yeah. order to uh, get, and what my students keep uh, telling me is that uh, it's better with the machine because you don't feel like it's judging you. So this is where you can just yeah. nail it down, get it to, okay, I don't understand this term, this term, this term. And eventually yeah. you start formulating uh, the world view. But when you're especially jumping into a new topic, you don't even know what you don't know and where you're looking at. So from that perspective, it's finally um, a way for us uh, where the power of the internet, right? The entire human collective knowledge at your fingertips. Yeah. It's now searchable and queryable in an uh, easy to understand manner. Yeah, and that that um, iterative version where you can choose to delve into something in greater, you know, so there's like a version of that experience where you're, you're uh, um, you know, understanding the high level and then you want to go into detail in one area. Yeah. And then there's also the version of your, you know, the first cut of it didn't make any sense and you have to keep, keep going back and back. Um, but yeah. both, both are interesting um, and like super satisfying. 
experiences, right? Because uh, you, you actually get that click. Exactly. And uh, now that we have the text to speech, uh, some people don't like reading. They prefer podcasts. Yeah. You can generate your own podcast on the fly on the topic that you want. Right. Right. Um, and uh, you can actually, ra uh, rather than um, listening to just the podcast uh, normally, you can talk to it. Right. You can say, dive into that. You can uh, yeah, interrupt with questions. Exactly. And uh, and as crazy as it is, it, that is now, I'm, I'm sure it's do a doable project. And uh, for uh, for a college student uh, as a final project to just say, OK, uh, connect ChatGPT with voice and uh, listen to uh, to me. So if you have Internet connection, you can now talk to it. Uh, and I, I've seen demos where people have been talking to the old GPT for in yeah. uh, May. Now with yeah. the, uh, this thing, uh, you can talk to it even uh, better, cheaper and easier. Uh, uh, that's another interesting use case for like the long memory version of uh, assistance, right? Yeah. Um, accumulating that way will be super interesting. I'm starting to wonder now if in like six months when when um, some of these applications that are being created now with that API uh, are sort of seasoning and getting a lot of data, if there might be some like interesting interesting new things that we start to, to learn about. Um, yeah. Uh, are you are you applying this in your work today? Like, is this is this like a is this part of the toolkit now? Uh so while I'm not at liberty to say exactly uh, the stuff that I, I am doing, uh, yeah, uh, we are playing with LLMs uh, both for uh, my work. Um, I'm doing it uh, for my stuff, um, so I'm I'm definitely using it to help. Uh, with my uh, with my teaching because it allows me to create uh, faster notes in order to make sure that I covered all of the material, uh, check if there's any uh, new uh, in, uh, directions that have uh, come up that I, I can include and become more aware of the uh, framework. Um, I have been uh, using the LMs as uh, you know, I'm helping a friend uh, with a video game so one of the yeah, things can you uh, for for yeah. everybody who hasn't heard this amazing story yeah sure I, I'm I, lucky enough that you've told me but uh, do you mind do you mind uh, you know telling telling us the story of your video game project so uh, this uh, is just uh, me being lucky that I uh, know some uh, crazy people uh, and the, uh, they're all, all uh, something awesome. tells me that's not a coincidence that you know some crazy people <laughs> uh, but uh, so what what he's uh, uh, essentially wanted to do was to create a completely procedurally generated game. Um, and it's a game that um, we uh, would like to uh, play with. Uh, as he uh, described, uh, the, the pitch that he uh, gave to me is to create a, a self-contained uh, world where if uh, you have a forest where the creatures were trained to see a particular type of colored fruit and they have learned to eat that type of fruit uh, and you go onto that uh, planet uh, wearing uh, uh, just for illumination a color that was similar, it will treat you as a, a prey uh, and it will start coming to you and uh, trying to nibble and, uh, and such. Uh, to have creatures that will be able to burrow into your uh, bases, into your ship, and that you can, when you're creating something on the planet, that you can have uh, these um, uh, effects ripple through. Um, the question then, okay, is that, yes, we all want to uh, play with that type of a game. We all want, want to create our own world. The question is, how do you do that? Um, and, and so we started building it from the ground up uh, in terms of uh, what, uh, how do, uh, what does the physics even uh, look like? So how uh, what kind of elements do we have? So how do they interact? Because when you start building from the ground up, you uh, all of a sudden you have things that are coming out for free. So for example, when you have a couple of things um, that you know have these particular properties, when you join them on a, a larger scale, all of a sudden you know that the creatures that are consuming these types of things have to... Uh, have to have these properties. This is how uh, this is how their uh, armor would look like. This is how their um, behavior looks uh, lo looks like. I know this is very vague, but since it's uh, his game, I don't want to be uh, digging into too many de uh, details. Sure. But uh, 
the uh, thing that is really making it uh, possible and uh, why this was just a completely opportune time uh, to start, we started before uh, all of this LLM st uh, stuff came uh, about, is that um, these tools have allowed a three-person team to um, rapid uh, fire uh, the development process. Uh, for example, we struggle to find artists that uh, we could uh, figure out, okay, what does the art look like? What What is the direction? Mid-Journey uh, completely allowed us to narrow down and focus on that. Um, what I'm doing now is that we are fortunate enough to have a writer who has now documented a whole lot about uh, the storyline, the planet, the, the physics, etc., we have a rag system, we have an assistant, we can start uh, generating more content procedurally so such that we can flush out uh, the middle parts, right? So maybe we don't describe everything that was on a particular planet or the entire history behind it, but we know the general arc of the history. We know the location of the planet, which means that uh, you can have these LLMs develop storylines for you uh, on that process. Uh, so that uh, developing that uh, kind of rag system is uh, been remarkably easy and uh, remarkably impactful uh, for the text generation. Um, there was the is uh, the uh, sorry, I'm sorry is the is the vision for that part of the system that um, these storylines will be sort of like static to the game, or you know, gameplay will sort of. No, that's the thing. LLM. Every time you play, uh, it should be different. Uh, and it can be different. The skeleton. Um, so it's the question of how do you balance uh, the um, ta uh, the tailored and crafted storyline uh, where you have dedicated writers giving right. you all of the information with something like No Man's Sky, which is just we're going to generate the entire uh, universe for you. Go out there and explore right? Yeah. How do you balance those things? And uh, by having a carefully structured skeleton of the storyline, uh, you can start uh, jazz, uh, jazzing it uh, uh, around it. You can start filling in uh, the blanks such that um, you can have um, every... Uh, so, for example, if you start generating a story in one location that you're exploring, uh, that uh, bit of a story can have little tags that get uh, generated. Uh, so, things that um, happen, right? Or uh, um, pro uh, that you can uh, then maintain. And when you're creating a new uh, storyline for a different planet or a different location, you can take a look at, these are all of the tags that are currently known to the player. Uh, based on that, I can constrain uh, the storyline that has occurred here, which then uh, creates continuity as you're exploring the world, you're exploring right. it. And it it's still so it, consistent. It makes it like real life where it's path dependent, right? Like whatever it, it, happened in the past. Exactly. You know, constraints the future. Is is the game going to, uh, tell me if um, any of these questions are like off limits, but is the game going to be multiplayer? Like, will this be happening? Single player. Uh, for the moment, uh, just single player. It's a yeah. three person team. There's a, uh, there's okay, a limit not, that we, what we can do in our- It's a very uh, high limit to productivity, but there is some limit. Yes, I, I, you should have seen uh, the face of my friend when I said, this is great, well, let's do it in VR, to which he looked at me and said, yeah, there's no way that I'm coding this thing in VR. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, another, another thing I wanted to turn to was uh, your career, because I think you've, you've made a lot of moves in your mm -hmm. career. And um, I think especially for like younger people who maybe are still undergrad or even graduate students. Mm -hmm. I think it's just really good for people to hear career stories where, um, you know, people like yourself have found a lot of success, but you've also made a lot of moves and made a lot of changes. You've changed industries. You've changed in a way you've changed disciplines a couple of times, I would say. I don't know if you would agree with that. Um, yeah. And uh, so I would love just to hear, um, you know, some of the you know, sort of more interesting transitions that you've made uh, and, and maybe some of the things you've learned uh, along the way. And I think, I think one thing that I think is really interesting with your story is it seems like you're always paying attention, um, you know, to, to what's developing adjacent to you. And you've made a couple of like really interesting moves. And I feel like that's a skill. I don't know if, if you see that as a skill, but 
it seems like a really valuable uh, skill, especially, you know, in today's world, things are changing, you know, every, every generation has said this, but yeah. things are changing so quickly. Um, so I think being able yeah. to assess those adjacencies is really important. I would like to, uh, I mean, it might be a skill, but I, I, probably a, a luck had a lot to do with it. Um, yeah. um, the one thing that I, I, I would say for, you know, anybody that is uh, still starting to learn, still um, um, trying to figure out where they want to go, it's, um, you, you have to continue to learn. Uh, that uh, curiosity, uh, you can't lose it because as soon as you do, you start uh, staying static. Um, and the things, uh, the world is continuously shifting and uh, changing. So it's just about um, more going with the flow, going, uh, figuring out, okay, uh, where do I want to go? Things, if things uh, change, you, ad you adapt, you learn a new uh, topic and you uh, move forward. Um, when I, I was a postdoc, um, I, I knew, uh, I wanted, to, uh, to go into academia. I wanted to, uh, teach, um, that is the direction that I always thought I, I was going to go. Um, but unfortunately my area, uh, was a bit, uh, niche. And, um, I realized that while I wanted to go into academia, I also didn't want to be a postdoc for the next, uh, six years or so. Um, finding uh, that um, perfect uh, opportunity for perfect position. So what um, I was uh, fortunate enough to find, okay, let's go to IBM research. Uh, maybe it's not academic research, then it's um, industrial research where I, I can, uh, rather than just creating algorithms that are theoretically interesting, let's start applying them to the real world to see if I can make an impact. Um, and then it's about, uh, it was about, okay, well, how do I uh, uh, develop something not where any researcher uh, probably knows where, okay, you, you, you create code, it works for your main, uh, your main case, and that's what matters. And then uh, all of your edge cases, that's uh, time for future work. We'll, we'll deal with it. Um, and then you go into industry where it's like, no, 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 no. Uh, it needs to work everywhere. And yeah. uh, so seemingly only edge cases in industry. <laughs> uh, so it, it has to uh, work there. Um, so that was um, a, an interesting thing to learn. How do you do that? How do you bu uh, build out these systems uh, that are more complex and work with other uh, people? Uh, then um, one of the things that... Um, IBM Research had a whole lot of powerhouses. It was a phenomenal experience to work there. Um, but again, I, I got into a, a position where it wasn't quite um, what I wanted to do. My uh, academic research was a lot about um, algorithm configuration and tuning. So um, uh, working with the, the Watson Analytics gr uh, Group um, uh, partially, uh, where uh, I was starting to look at, okay, if we have a machine learning algorithm, we have the entire pipeline, what that entire pipeline is, is a collection of decisions, which, how do you select your variables? How do you select your model? How do you select uh, your evaluation criteria? All of those are little parameters that you can tweak, uh, and you should tweak automatically in order to build the final uh, tool. Um, it was uh, fascinating, it was interesting, but um, um yeah it it was uh, also not the direction that um IBM wanted uh to really go at that uh, at that point so i decided you, to yeah sorry i just wanted to jump back in the story a little bit where you're a postdoc mm -hmm. and um you're realizing that it's going to be like a long wait right i think that was yeah. the key thing you were saying um how did you figure out like where to look in industry did that come to you was there like an advisor that suggested, you know, like um, how did you sort of like realize that there was an opportunity for you there? The ultimate uh, position at IBM, uh, that was fortunately uh, an old uh, advisor that um, helped me out uh, uh, there. But um, I knew that um, I wanted to do research. I still wanted to uh, play around with models. I wanted to uh, uh, be on the fringes. So I was uh, looking at um, all of the other research groups. So you Fortunately, you have the likes of Google Research, Microsoft Research, right. Amazon Research, Apple Research, 
Um, so started uh, practicing, doing the interviews, figuring out, okay, how do I uh, uh, apply and uh, uh, work, uh, yeah, get, get accepted yeah. to one of those groups. So I have, I have a theory that that first step, uh, a lot of people attribute to luck, but I actually think that's a skill where you maintain and have relationships with people, right? And that you're able to think of like, oh, I should ask this person about what I should be doing next. Or, you know, uh, you have a, a relationship where they trust you and they trust your work, right? That's, I, I think that's like a um, kind of like a hidden skill that, uh, you know, people that find success and it seems like, oh, they knew somebody or, you know, well, they knew somebody that kind of cuts both ways, right? If you're, yeah. Exactly. If you're a good person to work with, they'll know that. And if you're not a great person to work with, they'll know that too. So I, I feel like um, I always I always like to think, think of situations like that. If there's a way to have agency, it's like much more confidence inspiring to think like, oh, you know, while you're working as a postdoc or as, you know, studying for your PhD, that's a great opportunity to obviously do your research, but also develop your network and create relationships and have, you know, sort of that like human safety net um, for when you need to make a change. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's as you, you're absolutely right. It's the connections that you form. And th this is actually one of my uh, biggest recommendations for people is that yes, working remotely is a possibility. If you're just starting out, it's not so much that uh, going to uh, office is necessarily helpful, but you have to meet people. Uh, you yeah. have to make those connections. You have to have uh, make yourself um uh, known um otherwise you're you're going to be hurting your future um yeah just opportunities i think that's so true i i actually find um i think part of it is when you meet people in person and develop a relationship you, you know there's like a there's a lot of like high bandwidth nonverbal communication happening and i think the net of it is that you feel confident right if you have like a good relationship you have like a sense of confidence in that relationship and, uh, you know, I started working remotely after a long, you know, 20 years of, of um, you know, being in the working world and having relationships. And um, what I find remarkable now is uh, making, I find making decisions so much more difficult in a remote context than in a, a live context, because making a decision kind of requires some level of confidence, right? You have to feel confident in the uh, result you're getting. And what I've noticed over the past couple of years is that um, it's really, even if you make it explicit, like, do, you know, asking people, like, do you think this is the right decision? Um, it's really hard to get that feeling that you've got to like locked in and you're doing the right thing. And so one thing I, I find grinding is like remote work, um, you spend a lot more time with uncertainty because you just don't get that like human reassurance from, from being with, uh, Friends and colleagues, right? When you're making a call, yeah. Uh, so, well, uh, there, there is that. There is also the fact that um, when you're remote, yeah, you can schedule a meeting. You, you will do the thirty minutes, but you, first of all, you get screen fatigue, um, uh, and it's very easy uh, when you're talking on the screen, especially if there are multiple people, to zone out and uh, miss the conversation. It's a lot uh, harder to do that when you're in person. In, in person, you tend to focus. Everybody is on board. We're uh, we are sitting here and discussing uh, this uh, thing. We can uh, split off into small uh, groups, uh, continue to chat. Um, it just uh, creates a continual um, uh, bonding experience where you're working through the issues whereas with the screen okay you talk you uh you might come to a so, uh, solution but then it's like okay well now i have a new thing do i call them back uh and nobody <laughs> yeah. uh and especially for things that uh take a like 10 second question uh you you need to be right there to just hey uh is is this number correct yes no you move on they move yeah. on you're not waiting for that uh yeah. response um yeah the real the real-time feedback i think um that you get from you know just like watching the people that you're in the room with is huge and i, I it, what clicked from what you're talking is if you're new to the workforce yeah. or new to a company um 
you know, you grow really quickly because you're getting lots of feedback and like any, anything that will give you higher bandwidth feedback is going to be good early in your career. So I, I, th I think it's a really good call that uh, for people, you know, in their first job, like seeking something where it's, where it's in person, they can be with, you know, the people that they'll be learning from is, is huge. And um, you pick up all of the other conversations because if you're sitting in the more. office, yeah, yeah, you you see how other people talk to each other. You see what they talk about. You overhear those conversations. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. That, another thing. Uh, so a friend of mine was pointing out, uh, who, who's you know back in the office uh, these days, is um, I've forgotten this, but I remember you know you, you're in an office and you'll see people meeting. Yeah, and so your brain you know, like a really powerful part of your subconscious brain is like figuring out that there are connections between people and that, you know, there's like a, you know, a network that your brain can just observe and know without yeah. really a lot of like explicit work. And I, I feel like that's invisible. You know, you can't, you can't, obviously you can't see what meetings are taking place in a remote world. Yeah which is super interesting um or, and or, we're humans we're uh, ultimately social animals right uh hey. um during the beginning of the pandemic i uh you know i i'm i, I live in new york uh city uh, dense populate uh so i thought okay you know we don't know what's going on i'll uh, I'm, I'm i'm healthy i'll stay at home uh just so that i'm not causing further confusion out there on the streets um because while well, well, i can why not um it's brutal on your mind to just ice it, it's self-isolation it uh it uh destroys you uh, after yeah. a couple of months i was just like no i i, I can't take this uh, it's uh crushing we need yeah. social interaction absolutely um, yeah it's, it's a big part of what makes uh makes life fun is getting yeah. to uh, see other people um here, you know find out what they're thinking, feel what they're feeling. I think, I think that's the other thing is uh, a lot of, a lot of um, empathy, I think comes from, again, like nonverbal communication, being around people. And I think that uh, for some of us anyway, I think it probably depends on like your personality and introversion and extroversion, but that, that's true. that in-person connection is like such a, such a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about um, moving into finance uh, and just, you know, how that happened and also uh, what you think is sort of special about the domain. Yeah. Um, partially, actually, through uh, Quantopian. Uh, hey. So, uh, uh, you're well hey, world, hey, you're welcome. We got your to go into finance. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no it, it, it's the fact that uh, you guys had all of the data available um, uh, to play with. And uh, as, you, as you know, uh, as a beginning researcher, beginning uh, to work on any given problem, the main thing is, okay, well, what, what is the data? What are the techniques? How does this uh, even work? Um, so, started playing around, uh, got, uh, got uh, interested, got uh, hooked, uh, built a couple of algorithms for myself, never uh, got to compete uh, in uh, your systems, but uh, it, it was great for, as a training uh, platform uh, for me personally. Um, and then um, I got uh, fortunate enough to find uh, the position at JP Morgan that uh, was uh, doing... Uh, it's uh, it's akin to uh, like a center of excellence uh, type role where the idea is to build a centralized machine learning team that would then go and help out, out other groups. I have since then uh, developed um, slight hesitation towards those models because um, in order to really be effective with a particular team, you need to spend more than three months on a given project and then move on to something else. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be there meeting with them for a long period. Some of my projects at Morgan Stanley then took three or four years to get uh, to full production uh, stage system when we were able to automate it. But the benefit of those uh, centralized uh, groups is that you get to see every part of the company yeah. because you are being sent on uh, short projects here, there, there. You're able to learn, okay, how does the bond desk work? How does uh, 
the one of my projects was uh, predicting follow-on offerings uh, or uh, debt issuances. Um, we uh, because it was uh, the centralized group, we were also exploring all of the um, uh, what is it companies that were coming in in order to see what have they uh, what are they doing what are they pro proposing what are the niche uh, uh, policies that they're providing so it was and uh, of course uh, in that group um, they pulled in uh, powerhouse individuals from all over the firm because they were just starting the, uh, this thing from the ground up which means that now going back to the importance of building ne uh, connections and uh, networks I got to see all of the senior people, um, yeah. some of which I've then saw uh, in following uh, jobs and uh, conti uh, continued working with them. Um, so that was my uh, foray into finance. It's um, it was the um, it was an investment bank. Got to see how everything worked, so that when I was uh, got the uh, the thousand mi uh, mile view of uh, the financial industry. I was able to go into Morgan Stanley and then target one specific goal, uh, which uh, was automating the stock loan desk. Um, so with the stock loan desk, uh, uh, as you uh, know, and uh, but for the listeners, um, you have uh, companies uh, that come to uh, Morgan Stanley saying that, hey, I want to short 3000 uh, shares of Tesla, GM, whatever. Um, and uh, the bank would uh, take a look at their books and see, okay, can we approve this request or not? Um, and then uh, they would say, well, we can't do uh, the 3,000 shares that you asked for. We can do 1,000 shares. And then uh, uh, at this price, do you accept or you don't accept? And then if the company says, yes, we do, then they would uh, get those stocks. They can short it and uh, go off and do their thing. Um, the question is, well, there are a lot of requests coming in uh in 10,000 requests that are being manually uh, for just the North America that uh are done by like a hand uh, like six people that's right. not sustainable right so uh we got to build models that automated in the US which the market there is actually quite easy it's uh, the Asian markets that become fun where you uh, need to have those shares on board before you promise them out. So now you're dealing with an inventory optimization uh, optimization problem because now you need to know who's coming for what, how much are they going to ask for, and what is the probability of them actually executing on the trade? Because unless they execute, you're not getting any money. But if you already promised those shares to somebody else and they're coming in and there's nothing left, you've potentially lost a, a, a trade. Um, so, you know, what Yuri, I think might be interesting to explain is, uh, so the Asian version where you have to have the inventory on hand yeah. is probably the way that most people would assume lending stock would work in the first yeah. place. So it might uh, be interesting to explain the U.S. version and how that works. With, with the U.S. version, uh, you're, you're dealing with a high uh, trading uh, volume. So uh, there are certain uh, stocks uh, that might be... Um, uh, 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 very hot where there's only a small number of them available on the market. So you would uh, restrict those and not allow uh, automated trading uh, with those. With most of the other things, uh, with Apple, GM, Microsoft, there are thousands of those shares available. Uh, uh, and uh, if you don't have them on hand, you can uh, buy them from, this, uh, from the street uh, in order to cover your position. So um, you have a whole lot more uh, leeway with uh, more of your securities. Um, so that's the uh, the policy is there. In the China, uh, the Chinese markets, uh, they are um, less. Uh, they look less favorably on uh, shorting, uh, and uh, therefore the rules there are way more strict regarding um, what you can and cannot do. Um, in most cases, the uh, in both models, you're, which you're essentially pre uh, predicting is that if uh, most uh, clients will not trade the securities, so you can promise them that, yes, we will offer them uh, this amount uh, to you. But what they're actually trying to do is to figure out what is the price that you are offering and what is your availability. So they're not really asking for uh, you in order to trade. 
they're asking you in order to get an idea of what are the market conditions, and they will ask you about all of the securities. So under those circumstances, um, you're now playing a probability game where, okay, um, most uh, we've been asked for a billion shares. Um, if you actually uh, take us up on and try to uh, trade a billion shares, you are influencing the market at that point. Uh, you're not going to buy 50% of the market share of the company with those billion shares. So sure, we'll promise it to you. We'll give you the option. We know damn well that you're, uh, apologies for the language, that you're not going to uh, be uh, tr uh, picking us up on, on that kind of uh, trade. So that's where the game is. And uh, the U.S. has a, a much uh, laxer um, regulation on that. Europe as well. Um, the Asian markets, though, uh, they're, uh, they have uh, different rules. But this is what makes finance uh, so ultimately interesting, to answer one of your earlier points and why I have now become enamored with it, uh, where it's the same problem, but just based on the region that you're dealing with, you right. have completely different rules. So the models that you're building are going to need to be very different. And uh, how do you account for that? And how do you account for all of the new regulations that might come out uh, where, um, okay, now some of the shares up until this point, uh, you, they can be free until you get to this portion of your book and then uh, you have to deal with them. Or uh, for example, if you are just doing inventory management, that's one of the problems. But if you're also adding pricing on it, because now I can uh, do, well, you, uh, I really know that you're going to need these shares. Therefore, I'm going to give you a higher price. You, uh, I uh, I want to become, uh, become a better client and uh, I'll give you a lower price. Um, this is not to say Morgan Stanley is doing that. We never got to uh, the price uh, setting uh, while I was there. But uh, as an example, it just make, changes the problem so, so much that it becomes right. um, you, you're continuously sol uh, solving new challenges. Um, right. The constraints change the, like the, the problem so dramatically. Yeah. It, yeah, it's interesting. I, I do feel like people that really enjoy uh, working in finance, um, like truly love the details, uh, you know, and find them fun. You know, yeah. like as you're describing this, I can see there's like a, a mirth to to understanding like all the esoteria of of um, of uh, security lending in all these different different regions, and I feel like that really propels people. Do you, do you um, like for your students who are uh, studying computer science or data science? Yeah. Um, are you like? Do you recommend that they look at finance and go into it? Is it like how, who who's a match uh, for, for um, finance? And is now like a, yeah. a great time, a good time, a bad time to be thinking about finance? I mean, now we're going into the financial situation of, of the world, so I don't know. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would say, yeah, definitely, uh, it's a, a excellent uh, field. Uh, um, and uh, it's also a question of whether you want to be um, more back office, like what I was doing, where I'm, I deal with operations. I don't uh, really do live trading and uh, algorithms for that. Um, um, I think what I uh, tell uh, the students and what um, I, I push, it's the flexibility and um, uh, desire to learn. Uh, in order, I also caution that the types of roles that get to do all of this um, fun stuff, uh, at least what I call fun stuff, they also require uh, a lot of uh, education, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, there are tools all over the place uh, right now that say, well, we'll automate the machine learning uh, pipeline. We will uh, do everything for you. All you need to do is give us the cleaned up data and uh, uh, we'll give you the model. It will do the predictions that has never been the hard part of uh machine learning of uh, ai the hard part is to understand what it is that you're trying to solve which is why the three-month uh period that uh, a center of excellence would uh, typically uh, be concerned with is not enough 
because you need to really understand all of those details in order to understand exactly how um, the entire puzzle uh, fits together. Um, now, uh, and uh, the problem, the other problem is that there is a very limited number of those roles. So um, you, uh, I personally just recommend uh, you have to have a PhD. Uh, you have to have the, both the computer science and the mathematical background. Um, fortunately enough, uh, most of the financial institutions, especially if you're coming straight out of the PhD, understand that as long as you have the coding and the uh, mathematics uh, pillars strong, they can teach you the finance, right? Uh, and uh, you can get in uh, that way. Even, but, uh, even to the point where I think firms prefer to be teaching the finance, right? Because they feel like they have an edge uh, yes. in that aspect of it. Can you, can you go back? I think one thing that's super interesting uh, for people to learn is uh, the different types of um, work, you know, within a financial institution. So you mentioned like back office versus yeah. like stuff like trading. Can you talk a little bit more about that distinction? And, um, you know, I think one, one thing that uh, having gotten to know you a little bit, I think cuts through all of your work is you like to work on like, like very complex systems. Um, and uh, maybe you can talk about how you, scratch that itch um, uh, within within finance, especially like the back office side. Yeah, um, the back, uh, so even in the uh, back, so front office for me has always been uh, the trading algorithms that uh, built, you build out a, a, a trading portfolio, it, you can build out the risk model in order to identify, okay, for this given uh, portfolio, what, uh, what are the risk profiles of it? Where where is your exposure uh, for um, for the portfolio that uh, you have built? Which securities do you want to um, go go by um, uh, select? How do you deal with um, um, information? How do you uh, uh, the various types of information that you have? The famous example from uh, years ago where hedge funds were now uh, buying satellites in order to take imagery of tankers in order to see how deep in the water they are or how uh, filled up uh, different um, uh, uh, reserves were in, uh, in locations or traffic in uh, malls uh, with photography of uh, parking lots. So how do you deal with that type of data? How do you trade on it? Uh, that would be uh, my uh, front office knowledge. Apologies, this was never my area, so I'm scanning uh, at a high level uh, over what that is. Um, the back office, uh, this is where you now try to uh, automate the procedures of the bank or in the institutions itself. How do you take the data? How do you clean it? How do you process it in order for it to be useful? Um, how do you uh, build the automation uh, frameworks like the ones that I was discussing with uh, the stock loan desk? Um, there is a, a slew of reports that need to be automated, um, uh, either generated or um, analyzed. Just for example, contract data. Uh, one of my projects was to just say, okay, well, here's a, a whole bunch of scans that we have of all contracts. We want to be able to ident identify what are the terms that were agreed upon there. And there you have uh, fun and exciting things like somebody took uh, scans at an angle at a, uh, an extremely grainy image uh, where you start asking, why did you not spend two extra seconds to do a proper scan and now you have to do character recognition at an angle, which everybody that knows uh, the area, it's it's a nightmare. Um, and then you would have contracts where you have handwritten notes uh, commented in there and uh, illegible writing. So you, you get fun things like that. Um, so, but that would be a, an entire area that you would need to uh, do, or let's uh, do, um, uh, report, uh, end of the month, end of the quarter reports, um, uh, which was another one of my pro uh, projects where the team uh, build out a, a whole bunch of uh, spreadsheets uh, that coalesce the data that uh, uh, made the reports of, okay, these are our positions. This is uh, where we had uh, revenues. This is where we had losses. How do we, uh, and now we just want to create a highlight reel of this is what happened. Uh, and summarize it. So the interesting thing is that, uh, well, computers are great at that. You can just automate um, uh, a whole bunch of checks 
And if they happen, you write them, you identify them based on how interesting a particular move or change was in order to propagate that type of information. But that would be uh, what I would be referring to as back office work, automating those reports, automating, um, building out uh, more of a company-wide risk profile so that you will be able to uh, take a look at, okay, so given all of our positions and um, if, uh, for example, GameStop happens uh, once again, uh, what kind of a shock is that going to have for us? O or given uh, the portfolios and the positions of all of our uh, clients, um, we can, uh, we uh, well, they, uh, Morgan Stanley, would have a whole bunch of different stresses that they would uh, uh, hit all of the portfolios in order to see what would be the contagion effect. Right. So one of the things that you really don't want to happen is for uh, one of the companies starting to uh, hit their margin, uh, at which point they're forced to liquidate their positions. Those positions are heavily correlated with the positions of another hedge fund, which will then uh, hit them below their margin, which will then ca cause a cascading effect. So analyzing how do we even determine that a cascading effect is going to happen and how it will behave and what is the likelihood of it happening? that would be something for a back office uh, quant uh, to look into and develop those models. Um, so yeah, hopefully that at least gives a little bit of a overview. Yeah, yeah, I love those examples. That One thing that I um, I really love is when, uh, you're, when people get focused on how software interfaces um, with people, not just in the sense of like, you know, a user interface or something like that, but you know, uh, like human and computer mixed systems, right? And I think in finance, all the things you're describing in the back office um, are hybrid, right? There, There's like decision-making that, you know, has to be done by humans. There's regulations. There's a lot a lot of gray area for interpretation in terms of, um, you know, uh, accounting rules and things like this that re require... Uh, oversight and then the scale is so large that you know you need tons of automation so i think i think those are like really really fun problems to be uh to be working on um so just in the last couple of minutes here um wanted to ask uh you know if if um if you could sort of direct a whole quant token community to focus somewhere uh, on a certain type of problem um i think one of the things you know, that uh, I've enjoyed getting, as I've been getting to know you, um, it's just like having, you know, I admire people who have good taste in problems, you know, probably choosing good problems to work on. I feel like you've got a great track record of working on interesting problems. So uh, what are some like interesting problems that you would love to see people in the community focus on? Um, the gen, uh, the large uh, problem that I, um, I want to, uh people to focus on is um, interpretability of these Gen AI models. I think that's going to be the next uh, big breakthrough because right now, a lot of people are using them as black boxes, um, which is uh, great. You're able to get results, uh, but it's uh, playing with fire because you don't fully understand how the system works. Um, one of the things that um, I've made a career out of is how, uh, by understanding uh, how a technique works, you're able to manipulate it to your desires and you can start merging uh, techniques that are not really meant for the problem, but it has the correct input, the correct assumptions and the correct output. Uh, and the, um, so, um, with, why, uh, why are you so passionate about interpretability? Like, why why do you feel like that's like such a key, um, key problem? With, because otherwise, I you cannot trust uh, the system uh, blindly, right? Um, getting aside to, okay, we have created our artificial intelligence. They now have their own rights. They have the right to be obscure. That's not what we're talking about here. We are talking about uh, a, a specific machine that uh, does uh, tasks uh, for you. Uh, and that's where we are with the, uh, these tools. Now, if you are dealing with hallucinations, you have to understand, well, where are they coming from and why is the tool making them in order to be able to either 
um, anticipate that these are the situations where the model is going to be uh, behaving properly or uh, understanding why it made a particular decision because uh, it's like debugging any other type of code uh, if um, the thing is just breaking. So by understanding where it's breaking and why it's breaking, you're able to fix a bug. You're able to identify, oh, I'm actually dividing by zero here. Uh, so uh, why am I dividing by zero? And uh, what... what uh, um, and do, you, do you feel like this is the type of thing that's going to sort of put the speed limit on yeah. advancements? Like yeah. if, we, if we can't... It because seems like something would like limit the complexity of the systems that you could build without. It's not limiting. It's not necessarily limiting the uh, the systems. Uh, this is so with the LLMs, especially the ones that we have seen so far, and we have seen a lot of uh, breakthroughs in applications. But all of the applications that I've really uh, been seeing are in the areas where you have a tolerance for error. Right. Uh, we know that, OK, if, so, if if a machine is giving a bad commentary on a video, uh, that's not going to uh, kill anybody. If it's um, summarizing a document for you and it omits a sentence or it misclassifies something, yeah. it's not the end of the world. If it generates something and you read through it and you can check it, it's not the end of the world. It's automating all of those things, but uh, their criticality is not uh, there. If you are building now a system that is trading, if you are building a okay. system that has uh, consequences to uh, people's lives, for example, uh, the the car that uh, if it hits a human, right? I want right. to understand why is it hitting a human, uh, right? So that I can make sure that it never happens again. Um, and unless you have interpretability, you don't have uh, the promise, the guarantee Absolutely. that it's not yeah. going to happen again. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you can't you can't say honestly that you know the system will work exactly uh, in service. And I think that's going to be the next big blocker from um, things like um, banks or uh, yeah. financial institutions taking uh, this technology uh, seriously because I, uh, I believe uh, even uh, Morgan Stanley when they created uh, an advisor. Um, there was a couple of issues where it was making bad predictions. And at that point, who's responsible, right? Uh, yeah. um, and uh, yeah, so... Um, so if someone listening you know, agrees with you and excited about this and wants to uh, you know, get started with interpretability, where should they go? Like, is there a paper to read? Is there, is there a problem to study? What's a good starting point? I, I ate this answer, but I don't know yet. Uh, I, I know it's an area that uh, it needs to be done. I think um, the best well, way- means uh, you'll have to come back and talk to us. Yeah, I, 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 it, uh, the, the way to uh, start understanding it is by, um, the only way to uh, debug these tools is to fundamentally understand how uh, the transformer works. So uh, you need to understand the mathematics inside and out. Uh, so that uh, you can then start uh, extracting the in information. Um, shapely values, uh, those types of uh, techniques have been great for just deep neural networks and understanding um, just uh, fo their focus in order to uh, get an idea, okay, what exactly are they looking at? Which part of the uh, deep neural network is responsible for the eye placement, for the facial features when it's doing some sort of generation mm -hmm. or um, that is um, used to identify those things. So understanding the, uh, those tools is going to be extremely helpful. Very cool. Uh, Yuri, this was awesome. Thank you so much for hanging out for for uh, 90 minutes and sharing your experience and telling us about your work and giving us your advice. So thank you so much. Of course. Boss, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it, it was awesome.